Amen. Why don't we just give the Lord just some praise this morning? Why don't you go ahead and be seated. Father, we, we come today, and our hearts, may, maybe our mouths are not uh, outwardly and loudly proclaiming hallelujah like we will one day when we see you, but Lord, in our hearts, we are so thankful today for your presence. We're so thankful for your goodness, your love, your holiness, your majesty. Lord, that in a, in a world where there's many competing ideas of what life should look like, you have told us that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And that just calms my spirit today. Lord, would you speak to our hearts, whether they're those watching online or here on site, Lord, all of us want to hear from you today. Minister to us truth and give us direction for this next week and next month and the years ahead if you tarry. And Lord, show us how to walk in a way that brings glory to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It is so good to see you. I want to welcome you. Uh, we have some folks that are out of town today, and so I'm filling in for Greg this morning and JT's filling in for Matt, and I appreciate that, JT, but uh, thank you for being here, and we want to welcome you. If you are new to Anchor, uh, we want to give you a special welcome today. Thank you for being a part of our service. So there's a lot going on next Saturday. We need all of you, those of you who are watching and, and those of you who are here, it will be a, a outward, uh, an outside service, so we'll definitely be socially distanced, but we're going to meet up here at 4 o'clock next Saturday. And we're going to meet in this parking lot. We're going to pray over uh, our church and just the future of our church and what God has for Anchor. And then we're going to go next door to Cooper, and we're going to pray for Cooper and all this that's happening there. And then we're going to go over to McConnell across the street and pray for McConnell. And so we need you guys. Uh, both principals I've interacted with, and they are so thrilled that we're doing this. One said, we desperately need it. And so thank you for coming. So uh, that is next Saturday at 4 o'clock, and you guys plan on being there. Then on October the 14th, Wednesday evening, we're restarting uh, our corporate prayer time. And we want you to be a part of that. Every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, there will be prayer uh, in this place. And so go ahead and, and kind of rethink your schedule and what that's going to look like. Our youth are meeting uh, on Wednesday nights. And we, we would love for you to be a part of that. So mark down the 14th. And then looking ahead, the following Sunday, which is the 11th, we're going to be kicking off a class for Equip U. We're trying to kind of open back up gradually. And there was information that went out this last week in the e-news. We're starting the e-news again. And so it's going to be a class that will be Zoomed, but also uh, in person. It will be in modular 2A at 9 o'clock. So we'd love to have you be a part of that. And then last but not least, this is the very important announcement for all of you who are, who are watching and those in present. We are going to be having our, uh, basically it's like a farewell marriage retreat for Windshape. This will be the last time. Windshape is kind of shut down for churches coming in doing their own thing, uh, they have, they're going to be doing just a program-driven uh, thing at Windshape from now on, but this will be our last opportunity for a marriage retreat as we've been doing for, for many, many years now, and we only have 25 spaces, so if you are interested in going, it's February the, uh, I believe it's the 11th, let's see, the 11th through the 13th at Windshape. If you are interested in going on this last marriage retreat, we're going to be looking at vertical marriage. It's going to be a great time. Wally Wallace will be emceeing, and uh, it's going to just be a lot of fun and a lot of encouragement, but most of all, a lot of great truth for your marriage. If you would see Donna today, uh, we, need to, uh, we need to actually have some idea of how many couples are interested in being a part of that. She can talk to you about cost, etc. If you would see Donna on your way out today and let her know that there is at least an interest on your part, so we'll know um, about how many we've got going. 
thank you guys for being here today. Let's, let's uh, stand back up and you get some exercise this way. Let's stand back up and uh, why don't you wave at those around you? Can you do that? We can't shake hands, but, but we can wave. All right, there you go. They can't tell if you're smiling or frowning, so it's nice to wave. And let's continue to worship the Lord. Lost are saved, find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every fear has no
sing, there is power. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. So break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. You know, so I, one of the things that I've learned is that the enemy that we were just singing about how the Lord can break every chain, 
that the forces of darkness will bring against us, that the enemy will, will sit back in a lot of ways and let us do a lot of things in, quote, the Christian life. But one of the areas that the enemy will really push against in a major way is when you start to pray. And, and I found that out of all the things that I, that I do in my walk with the Lord, the one area that has consistently throughout my life been one of those areas that I have to just really dive into, I have to be intentional about, is the area of prayer. It, you know, it, it's, it's just incredible to me that you can sit and, and you can read articles and and magazines and books and lots of things and you can concentrate and you can watch a three-hour football game or whatever else but when it comes to prayer with, within about three minutes your mind is wandering Amen. you know and they're just there's just stuff going all over the place and um you, you oh oh no you know i'm late i've got to go do this and and we're out the door and then we wonder why as a church in, in america is there so much powerlessness? You know, God has always had a remnant. And when you read the Old Testament, it's very clear there's always a remnant. And there's always a remnant moving through and moving up, and, and God is calling them out, and he's sorting out. I'm, just, I'm in Ezekiel right now, just reading through how, how God is sorting out, and he is, he is preparing that remnant to, to be used again, to continue on for his name's sake and for his glory. And and I really believe that right now the way God is going to raise up a remnant is that men and women of God are going to begin to have a fresh burden to pray. How about you? How's your, how's your prayer life this morning? We're in a series entitled Pursue. And you know, when just the very word pursue means that you are running after something, that, that you are chasing something. You are, you are putting energy and effort into this whole concept of of, of chasing something. You're, you're making decisions that impact how you spend your 24 hours a day. And one of the areas that I think it's so important that we pursue is this whole area of prayer. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at what it means to pursue prayer. Now, when you think about prayer, a lot of people think, oh, I know ACTS, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. You know, I, I've got that down. I, I I can do that. I can walk through that. But here's the thing that we forget about prayer. Prayer is not something we do. Prayer is someone we meet with. It, it is an intimate, relational interaction between us and the living God of this universe. God wants us to begin every day being reminded of His loving relationship with, with us. Without relationship, there's no, really, there's, there's no beginning place for prayer. So prayer, someone has said, I, I, sometimes I write down things and I forget to attribute them to the person who said it, but I like this one. Prayer is weakness leaning on omnipotence. And, and when, when we come to the place and we say, God, you are God and I am not, that is a huge declaration from our, the throne room of our heart. God, you are God. I am not. I am weak. You are strong. Lord, you are omnipotent. I am definitely not. And so I'm leaning upon you. I'm running to you today. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. And this is going to be interesting to some of you. We're only looking at one little phrase. But I think if we get this phrase right, everything else will fall in place. Now, you guys know that in Matthew 6 is when Jesus gave us what many people call the Lord's Prayer. Probably a better name for it is the Disciples' Prayer. And it wasn't given to the disciples for them to memorize and routinely, rotely pray back to God. It was given, he says, in this way. He was just giving them kind of, a, here's a picture of how we pray. Here, here's, here's a guideline of, of what it means to walk through and, and acknowledge a relationship and then to worship God and, and, and then to have sonship, you know, the, the give us this day our, our daily bread and forgive us our, our debts, forgive our, our debtors, and then 
fellowship that comes out of that. And then do not lead us into temptation. But deliver us from the evil one is literally what the, the Greek infers. And, and so it was, a, it was a guideline. But the first phrase of this prayer is pray then in this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father who art in heaven is what I want to kind of lock in on today. Here is this interaction between you and your Father. The word for prayer, Jesus said pray then in this way. The word for prayer is a word that basically has two parts to it. It's prosuke. And so you have pro towards, you're, you're leaning towards God, if you would, and, and then this talking to God, this interaction with God, and the actual word is prosukamai. But the picture is it, it, that it's a present imperative. It is to be the habit of our life that we are constantly kind of leaning in towards God and interacting with Him. Now let me say, first of all, most people, the minute they start hearing a message on prayer, they kind of lock into this legalistic mindset that I've got to spend X number of minutes a day setting aside, this is how I'm going to pray. And I really believe that when Paul says that we are to pray always, that the attitude in the heart of our life should be that we are regularly, constantly moving throughout our life in an attitude of prayer. As you're driving, you're talking. As you are interacting with people, you're, you're, you're thinking about the fact that, that God is giving you the insight into how am I to interact with this person? What is it that I, Lord, give me wisdom. And, and, and so, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. God, I praise you. I mean, there's a, a constant, regular, you're walking in an atmosphere of prayer. Does that make sense? It's like breathing oxygen. You're breathing prayer. You, you're you're talking to the Lord, and you're, you're, He's talking to you. I mean, your, your eardrums aren't reverberating, but in your heart, there's something that's going on. And so that's kind of the picture. Pray, then, in, in this way. Now, the word, prosukamai, encompasses all aspects of prayer. We're not talking about all these today. Submission, confession, petition, supplication, intercession, praise. Thanksgiving, it's, it's a very general Greek word for prayer, but it's this idea of that, that in all of these areas, you are you're leaning in towards the Lord. And so prayer, in one sense, begins with God first, not with us. So his heart is he has pursued us, and, and he has sought us out, and he wants us to interact with him. John MacArthur said this. He said, if we never gained anything from prayer but the communion with God that prayer really is, that should be sufficient to make prayer a constant thing. If, if all we got was the fact that, that God, is, God is desiring us to interact with Him, if, if that's all we got, then it's, it's enough. It's not like, oh, all right, Lord, give me, give me, give me. I've got my list here, and, and you better check off all, all the ticks that I have. Here, I mean, I tick, 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 tick. I, I want to have these. That's not, that's not the attitude that Jesus is talking about here as he's teaching his disciples. So prayer is more than just the privilege of communing with God. Prayer is the opportunity for God even to go beyond that communion to display his glory to us, to show us who he is, to demonstrate who he is. An old saint, I believe this was a Puritan, said this, True prayer begins, brings the mind to the immediate contemplation of God's character. So brings the mind to the immediate contemplation of God's character and holds it there until the believer's soul is properly impressed. I love that. It had to have been a Puritan that said that because that sounds just like the Puritan. So... It starts with your mind, but it ends up with your heart being transformed. There's something that is happening inside of you. So just quickly, what I want to do is take that phrase, Our Father who art in heaven. I just want to take that phrase 
and just kind of think about it. And the first thing that we see is that prayer has a requirement. There's a requirement here. Our Father. Let, let's personalize it. My Father. Now, spiritually, on the spiritual realm, an unbeliever, somebody who doesn't believe in God, rejects Jesus Christ and the divinity of Christ and the gospel, ha has nothing to do with God. What Scripture says in John 8, 44, Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil. You are of your father, the devil. And so the, the truth is, is that for an unbeliever, they cannot say, my father, who art in heaven. That, that's, that's really not where their heart is. It's only for those who receive him that Jesus says that they're given the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. That's John 1.12. We are given the right, the privilege, the calling to become the children of God. We are birthed into God's family. Listen to Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 16. Verse 14, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Sons of God, hear what it says? Sons of God are being led by the Spirit of God. In other words, we, when we are born again, we pass from darkness into light, from death into life, from being children of the devil, if you would, to being birthed into the kingdom of God, and we are now children of our Father. Many of you might remember me sharing this, but I'll share it again. It's one of the joys of being somewhere 23 years. Um, this, is a, this is a very important part of my testimony. I was, in, I was in junior high, what they called it back then, middle school. But I, I was in junior high, and uh, I was elected to be the chaplain. I didn't, first of all, I didn't know what a chaplain was exactly. But I was elected to be the chaplain of, they used to have something called High Y and Tri High Y. It was a part of the YMCA program, and they had these service organizations and, and local schools, and they were Christian-oriented. And so I'd gone to it, and they, they elected me to be the chaplain. And so the teacher, who was the sponsor for that club, came to me and said, look, you need to go to Rock Eagle this summer. There's a week training camp for all the officers. And so I said, okay, that, that, sounds, that sounds neat. And so uh, I went, and the first day they, they said, all right, now all the chaplains go over to this building, all the presidents go over here, and all the vice presidents, and blah, blah, blah. So I went to the chaplains meeting. And in that meeting, the first thing they said was, okay, chaplains, your number one responsibility is every time there's a meeting, you have to open it in prayer. And I'm not kidding you. If I could have run out of that room, I would have. That scared me senseless. I just could not imagine standing up in front of people and praying. You know, God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? <laughs> Here I am, uh, many years later, that's what I've done my whole life. But at that time, I could not do that. Now, by the end of the week, God began to convict me of something. I I'd grown up in a church where when you became 12, all the 12-year-olds went down, they were given a Bible, they were welcome to the family of God, and, and, and they, were, they were sprinkled. And that's what I did. And so I thought, hey, I'm in like Flint, right? I I'm a... I'm a member of God's family, I'm a Christian, and everything's cool. My heart was far from God. And so there I was trying to figure out what is prayer and what do you do? And I thought you just maybe read some words. And by the end of the week, they, they had this drama that God just used to convict my heart. And I remember that night walking back to my room so distraught over, it was, it was about the prodigal son. And, and you know, I said, I'm the prodigal son. And I went back and and the boys were, you know, they were trying to have a pillow fight, and everybody's going crazy. And I was, I was, I was grieving. Now that was not when I was converted. It wasn't till that fall, a little bit later, that I went back to school as fall began and the new school year was beginning. And I told the teacher I lied to him. I said, you know, I've got too busy a schedule. I really can't be a chaplain, and I didn't want to pray. And so he released me. 
But it was a few weeks later, we had a late witness weekend, and that's when God got a hold of my heart, and I was, I was converted. I heard the gospel, I understood the truth, and I put my trust in Jesus. Well, one of the first responses that came out of my life was, was prayer. Prayer is something that happens in the life of a child of God, because our daddy, our father, speaks to us, talks to us, draws to us, and, and wants us to fellowship with him. True saving faith affects the way we live our lives. Can you say amen to that? It affects the way we pray. It's not just a routine thing. So listen to verse 15 of Romans 8. But you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy. Now the word in... Our Father, who art in heaven, is the Greek word pater, P-A-T-E-R, pater, however you want to pronounce it. But Jesus talks about, and Paul talks about, this Aramaic word, Abba, which is, is uh, basically synonymous to our English word, Daddy, Papa. And it's a, it's a very comforting word. It's, it's a word of, of familiarity. It's a word of closeness. It's It's a word of relationship that is birthed in love, and it's a word of acceptance where you're not being held at arm's length, where you're not trying to crawl into God's presence and you're afraid He's going to strike you down with a lightning bolt. You're able to say, Abba, Daddy. That's the the spirit of adoption that we have received. Verse 16, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So here's this internal witness inside of us that we have been converted, that we have peace with God, that we can talk with Him and have a true relationship with Him. But it is the requirement of that is that we understand that Jesus is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who went to the cross, died for our sin in our place, We deserve death. He was buried. He was resurrected that we might have life. And when we put our trust in him, as many as receive him, to them he gives the right to become a son of God, a child of God, a daughter of God, if you would. And so that's the requirement, if you would, for prayer. And so it's very different when you are praying to your daddy. It isn't some... I've heard people say, my prayers hit the ceiling. Well, where do you think your prayers are going? Are they going to the attic? Are they, are they going out to Alpha Centauri? Or, I mean, where are you shooting your prayers? Jesus lives where? His Spirit lives inside of us. You're not shooting your prayers out somewhere. He lives inside of us. You're talking to Him. This isn't self-talk I'm talking about. You're talking. You're having a relationship And you're talking to the Lord Jesus Christ. And even though you don't see him, you believe. Jesus said, blessed are those that have that that kind of heart and that kind of attitude. And so I begin by claiming my relationship and becoming conscious then of the revelation that arises out of it. And so the second thing we see, our Father who art in heaven, we see a revelation. Our Father, our Abba. What can we learn about our Father when you go through Scripture? Well, we learn, first of all, that He is committed. He is committed to helping. He he teaches us to pray with a sense of security in His heart. Listen to Luke chapter 11, verse 13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, so your moms and dads that are in here, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? How much more is God inclined to lean in towards His children, to love us, to care for us, to minister us, to give us direction, even more so than our Heavenly Fathers? So let me stop just a moment. Why in the world, if that is true, would we not regularly pray? Because our flesh 
battles against it. The prince of the power of the air, the, of the forces of darkness, battles against it. Everything in us, in this world, it battles against us. Where the world says you are to be a self-made person, it all is battling against that truth. In fact, what the enemy wants you to believe is that the Father is angry with you. Is that the Father is not pleased with how you're living. He's not pleased with what you have done. The enemy wants you to be religious if you want to, but just have a wrong understanding of your relationship with God. Some of you, the moment I started this message, felt guilty because you know your prayer life stinks. Why did you feel guilty? You see, when we understand our daddy's heart, there's never a time that he says, don't come to me. Because of this second truth, you know what? He loves us. He loves us. Do you believe that? John 6, 16, 27, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me, Jesus said, and have believed that I came forth from the Father. The Father himself loves you, Jesus said to his disciples. He loves you. You will not sustain a life of prayer if you believe that God is angry at you or neutral about you. In fact, how you perceive God affects your interactions with Him. Um, I'm, I'm going to share something I forgot to ask Donna permission to share, so I hope she doesn't care. Are you smiling under your mask? Just nod your head. Thank you. Okay. Good. I feel better. So um, God used a picture, an analogy in my wife's heart, and it was just a precious time. I saw it, and I saw her tears. And We have a deck that's a little high. It's a screened-in deck, and we have deer that come out in the backyard. They're pretty close. And usually if the deer hear anything, um, they, they run. But we had been out there eating. We, I mean, we, we eat out our back deck a lot. And we had music playing, and we had been talking and laughing, and interacting and I said I looked and I said Donna there's two deer down there she loves to see deer they were little bitty deer and so she got up and one of them immediately ran but the other one just kept eating and would look up white ears look up at her and just keep eating and so this went on and the next day the same deer came back and so she named the deer girl she said, hey, girl, and she's talking out just loud, and the deer look up at her and, and then keep eating. All the other deers that have come have, would all run, but this deer wouldn't. And then she was getting a little bit more, you know, so she walked out the screen door in another part of the deck that's not screened in, and, and the, the deer finally ran. Now, here's the analogy that God gave Donna. That how many times in her life and, and I included myself. How many times in my life are we like that little skittish deer who's living our life, doing our thing, and God says, hey, Steve, or hey, Donna. We put our ears up and we run. Because in our hearts, we, we fear, we fear, and we believe the lies that somehow, some way. God's either not happy with us or he might harm us. Or there might be something there that would produce a spirit of fear in us. See, some of you are there this morning. You're looking at this world, you're looking at life, and you're, you're, you're fearful what's going to happen. What, what, what might God call me to do? How might God use me, my life? How you view God majorly colors your interactions with Him. What did, what did the book of Hebrews say? Let us come boldly. Let us come boldly before His throne of grace. See, Donna went, she said, do you think you'd eat an apple? She wants to feed him now. I've got to go to Home Depot and buy corn. Uh, you know, 
who knows, that girl may be coming up boldly. You may be petting girl one day. I mean, I hope not, but that, that, that may, may be what happens. But here, here's the third truth about this whole thing, this real revelation, is that the Father knows what's best. Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, the Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And then when you go on down, in verse 31, it says, Do not be anxious in saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For with all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your Father, your Heavenly Father, knows that you need all these things. See, since He knows your need, what Jesus is teaching is that you don't have to be anxious about your need. You don't have to be anxious about your need. He already knows what you need. He knows what's best. You know, the prodigal son is really not about a prodigal son or a self-righteous son. It's really about an incredible father who is willing to forgive a self-righteous older brother and a prodigal son who was unrighteous, but he was willing to forgive them both. And it was a picture of, of the Father's heart. And so when we understand that this, this revelation, our Father, when we're saying our Father, it is a phenomenal revelation of the fact that God is committed to us as His children. He has redeemed us with a purpose to glorify Him, but He's also redeemed us with a desire to meet our needs as His children. He loves us and He knows what's best for us. It's incredible understanding. Let me see one last thing. There's a realization that, that comes in all this. It's, it's our Father. And let's just, and by the way, the entire disciples' prayer is plural. And, and I, I believe it's because God has called us, God has called us to a body. He wants us to be a part of a body. He wants us that we, there, there's no such thing as, hey, I'm, I'm doing Steve Church today. You know, it's just me and my personal relationship with God. I've heard people say recently, well, you know, I don't believe in the organized church. I mean, I want to say, do you believe in the disorganized church? I mean, what, what, what kind of church do you believe in? Well, I'm a follower of Christ, but I don't believe in the, in the organized church, and I believe there, there's too much stuff that goes on, and I'm just going to, I'm going to be at home, and I'm going to have my personal walk with God, and and everything is going to be okay. But I, that's not what God calls us to. God calls us to a body. And, and we are to be involved in each other's lives. And so when you, when you come to this concept of, of my Father, it's our Father. It's our Father. Our Father who art in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven. In, in the book of James, in James chapter 5, verse 13, it says, is anyone among you suffering? That's a question. And there must have been a great response to that question <laughs> because the people that James were writing were definitely suffering. There, there was a lot of suffering going on. Is anyone among you suffering? In fact, let me ask you that question. Is anybody in this room suffering this morning? And there, there are probably a number of you. Is there anybody watching this message that you're suffering? There's probably a number of you that are suffering. Then what does he say? Then he must pray. He must pray. The word suffering refers to any difficulty or problem in life. Physical, spiritual, emotional, financial, relational. We're not exempt from trials. Can you say amen to that? <laughs> We're not. There's not a single one of us that gets the get-out-of-trial-free card. We're all going to go through trials. We're all going to go through suffering. Life in this fallen world is hard. And so what does James say? He must pray. So is prayer our first response? Is prayer the first response of our heart? Let, let's be honest. I mean, here's a confession. There are times when I find myself in suffering that I throw a pity party and I send out invitations and rarely does anybody else come. Donna will usually show up dutifully. It is difficult when you're going through suffering. But our first response, James says, 
then we must pray. We must pray. That's what we're to do. Now, I've watched this through the years. People have something bad happen. Somebody they love dies. They, they have money stolen. They, they lose their job. Uh, difficulties in life come. And, and if you're not careful, you will get angry, and then ultimately you will get bitter. Why did that happen to me? How could I have been in that situation where that happened to me? And, and when, when you think about what Jesus is teaching, in all of these verses we've looked at, he is saying the issue is not the issue. The issue is not what has happened to you. What has happened to you is common to all men. There are, there are hard times. There's sadness. There's tears. The issue is not your circumstances. The issue is that your heart, your heart has to come to me first. And you come to me and you, you cast all your cares upon me. You lay these things down in front of me. And when we begin to realize, you know what, there's not a single thing that can come in my life that is too big for my Father who is in heaven, then I can come and I can take all of these burdens and I can lay them down at his feet and I can be changed because the issue is not the circumstances. The issue is my heart. And when my heart is changed, my perspective is changed, and my pursuit then is changed, and I begin to move in a direction that is healthy and right and whole, even in the midst of suffering. This is, this is important that we get this right. Now, someone has said, you can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you shouldn't do anything until you've prayed. Just the fact that you pray doesn't mean you sit around and twiddle your thumbs and wait for, wait for God to do something for you. But the first thing you do is you go to God and you let Him change you. Psalm 50, verse 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Just, just quickly here. When I, when I have this realization, I realize I don't have to fear. This is good news. The pagans feared their idols, their deities. The pagans feared their de deities. They just thought, oh no, if I, I haven't done something right, it, it's not going to rain on my crops and my crops are going to die. Or, or, or this, this, quote, little G God is going gonna, is gonna to get me and, and kill me. But here is, here is the God of this universe who spoke and all that is that came to be. He is the greatest being that's ever lived and he is giving us as his children the invitation to come and to trust his heart to trust his heart and not be fearful and not be fearful that means we have hope hebrews 6 19 by the, by the way i love it in the christmas story when the first thing the angel said the shepherds was what fear not I mean, there, there had been 400 years, much longer than the, the history of the United States <laughs> as far as the nation. There had been 400 years from Malachi to those angels showing up on that first Christmas Eve saying, fear not. Fear not. I, I love that. So we have hope. Hebrews 6, 19. It's the verse that our church was built upon this this hope we have as an anchor for our soul 
we have hope. We, we gaze at God and, and we, we glance at our circumstances and, and we see how much more our Heavenly Father will love and protect and help His children. But, but ultimately, our hope is in the heart and the nature and the glory of God. And so it's not about us, it's about Him. And that's how we are changed. We have hope in Him. And we'll never be alone. We'll never be alone. He says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Don and I have been having conversations now that we are both in a significant age. Of, uh, in, in our, in our mid-60s, we've been having conversations about the future and about life and about, um, I've had people come and say, you know, you might want to do prearrangements. <laughs> prearrangements. You gotta be kidding me, you know? Would you like cremation or burial? I mean, no, stop. But here's the truth. Can I just say something? Here's the truth. There's not a single one of us that knows what tomorrow holds. You know that, that that's the truth. So do we live in fear? Oh no, oh no, God's gonna get me. No. No, that's not what we do. We acknowledge that Jesus said, first of all, if you die. You don't really die. In fact, what he said, anyone who believes in me will never, what? Will never die. He said, well, what does that mean? That means even though your body might wear out, your heart might stop, you might have a car accident, something may happen where you're instantly, your human body stops. If you're a child of the king, you immediately step out of that body, and you're in his presence. And so Jesus said, I will never leave you, right? So he's been walking with you since you've been a child of the king, and the moment that body, he said, well, glad we got rid of that thing. You're just walking on with him the rest of the way right on to heaven, and, and, and you're going to be with him for eternity. And guess what he says? He says he'll never forsake us. He's not going to say, hey, would you stop following me and go back home? I doubt seriously that my brother's watching this, so please don't take this personally if he is. But I'm, the first moment of rejection I remember in my life, I was three years old. My brother was 10. And he was going out to play with his friends, and I was following and I'll, I'll never forget, it happened in the front yard in East Point, Georgia, on Lancaster Avenue. I can still replay it in my mind. And my brother turned around and said to my mother, Mom, make him stop following me. He's driving me nuts. And I'm sure I drove my brother nuts. I drive a lot of people nuts. But I'm telling you, my three-year-old heart broke. And I went back in the house, and I said, why does my brother not want me to follow him? And I'm telling you something. There's never a time when the Lord Jesus Christ will look at the Father and say, Father, make him quit following me. Our Savior is the one who says, I will never leave you nor what? Forsake you. We will never be alone. We have unlimited resources in Christ. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1, 3. Every spiritual blessing. I'm not talking about these health, wealth, prosperity guys that are telling you, you know, your mansion, your cars, and all these things. You know, if, if, you, if you give and all of everything. Listen, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about all that's ours in Christ. We are co-regents with him. We are, we are co-laborers with him. We are co-beneficiaries with him. I mean, when, when you think of all this ours that Scripture teaches us, it's mind-boggling. And then we have a new focus in our life. We're to fasten our eyes on Jesus. Some, some of us have a hard time getting beyond ourselves to do that, but we fasten our eyes on Jesus. So, so here, 
here we are at the end of, of this message. There's a requirement. You've got you to be a child of the king. There's a revelation. When everything is falling apart, you're able to say, my father, my father. And all that means. And then there's this realization of the amazing beauty of this relationship with God. It is incredible. There's never a moment of rejection. Make him quit following me. In fact, Jesus said, follow me. Follow me. So here, here's, my, here's my challenge this morning. Prayer is not an option that we choose way down the list of what spiritual thing am I going to do today. Prayer is the lifeblood of what God calls us to be about. And so I'm going to ask you in just a moment to repent. To, and what that means is you change your mind about your, how you're thinking about prayer. It's not a legalistic activity that you must do to check off. But I want you to change your mind in the fact that it is a relational activity that God gives you the privilege to have with Him. And then when we are not interacting with Him in that way, we are living far below all that God has for us. As Vance Havner used to say, we are playing marbles with diamonds. That probably doesn't connect except with the older people. But you guys get it. Don Miller was here a number of years ago. Precious saint. And he said this. He said, worship is where you and God get together and exchange hearts. You leave with his, he leaves with yours. Now, I would say that prayer is where you and God get together and exchange hearts. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, prayer is beyond any question the highest activity of the human soul. Man is at his greatest and highest when upon his knees he comes face to face with God. What does Colossians 4.2 say? Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Our confidence is not in prayer. Our confidence is in God. The stronger your relationship with the Father the healthier your life in this fallen world becomes. I'm not talking about physical health, but your spiritual health gets stronger and stronger. And so everybody in this room is either trusting God or trying to be God this morning. And so repenting is changing your mind about how you view this whole thing. And so I'm going to ask you to take just a moment. We're going to stop here, literally. And I want those of you watching and those of you in this room to take a moment and say, God, would you forgive me for the prayerlessness in my life? Would you forgive me that even though I proclaim that Jesus is my Lord, I am a practical atheist in the sense that I run my own life without any dependence upon you? Will you forgive me? Will you cleanse me? Will you give me a heart that is absolutely surrendered and submitted and committed to you? And may prayer not just be something I do early in the morning or late at night, but may prayer be the atmosphere that I live in. Let's bow our heads. You take a few moments and you talk to God. Let Him, let Him change you. Father, sometimes what we need is just to have a teachable heart. And so we come this morning, Lord, as little children, saying, Lord, would you teach us? Would you teach us? Just as the disciples said to you, teach us how to pray, and you gave them that disciples' prayer. But Lord, we're asking you to 
Take us even deeper. Teach us what it means to walk by faith in prayer, to pray without ceasing, to let it be the air that we breathe, the world that we live in. That Lord, show us how to constantly be depending upon you every moment of every day, whether consciously or subconsciously. Lord, may that be the passion, the desire, the movement of our heart in our life. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Thank you, Lord, that you're already answering and that we're going to be changed. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise team, why don't you guys come on back up. You know, the beauty of, of our daddy as he deals with us is when he changes us, we're to celebrate him even more. We're to celebrate his goodness and his worth, his value, his glory. So let's stand together and let's, let's close out by, by doing that today.
Thank you for joining us today and for welcoming us into your home and into your life. Maybe something in the sermon struck a chord with your heart today. Or maybe there's something that you need prayer for. Maybe today was the most important day of your life and you welcomed Christ into your heart as your personal Lord and Savior. Wherever you are in your spiritual journey, we would love the chance to be able to pray for you. Please feel free to email us at prayerline at anchorholds.org and we'll get back with you really soon with any resources that you may need. We hope the service today has been a blessing to you and we hope that you'll make the decision to join us again next week either online or in person. We'll see you soon.